or or uh, or what will be in a later time they use uh, a seal a se a se made of uh, what was that uh, uh, wax on wax yeah, yeah. and you get the seal yes. that's something that you put on something you won't close a letter yeah. or a jar or whatever that has to be closed mm -hmm. and has to be opened only by the person yes. it's intended okay. since we are in the city of david we have to say sometimes we can prove things by the contrary yes. Yes. I will tell you, for instance, the Bible is talking about David. David, the great king of Israel, the one who gets the promise that from God that there will always be a descendant and, there will, and the last king, the last king will be anointed and will rule forever. You know, the Messiah comes from David. We are so much connected to David. So those who wrote the Bible, they could have embellished a little bit the story of David. Like a lot of books are doing that about someone who is important, about the king making... But the Bible is not complacent. The Bible is telling us David, the same David we are talking about, is a man who, maybe in this palace, was looking at a woman that was another man's woman and coveted her. And he had something with her. And maybe he wanted to cover the traces. You know, when you read, you don't have to really to read between the lines to understand what is happening here. It's something that can happen today, and that probably happens. The man has, this man, he's a king, but he's a man. And he sees a woman he wants. Her husband is in the military. So, because he's a king, he uses his strength. You know, today is not worth consider in the time of Me Too. That's, that's a typical case of Me Too, yeah? Mm -hmm. And he has something with his woman already. Now he's afraid that the husband might find that. that the husband coming back from the war will find his wife pregnant. And that's not good. Hmm. So he invites the husband, what was the name? Uriah. Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. To come to the palace under false <clears throat> pretense. You know, I've heard about you from your commander that you're a great soldier. You're, come, I'll give you that honor. Come to my table and you'll have dinner with me. <laughs> and drink some wine. I have the best wine. I'm the king. And what Uriah says, you know, he's not stupid, this guy. Mm -hmm. You understand? Why me? And he said, no, no, I cannot drink wine. I cannot enjoy this meal when my men are there fighting. I cannot. And David tries many times to entice him to drink, and he doesn't want. Then when David sees there's no choice, he tells him, okay, so go home with your wife, spend a good night, you deserve that. And he say, I will not do that too. I cannot go with my wife and join with my wife when my men are... I think that Uriah has already smelled the problem and the issue, and he knows that. And he cannot tell to the king, you are a liar. <laughs> and worse than that. So he said, I will sleep at the gate of the palace among the guards. That means everybody will know that he did not sleep in his own bed with his wife. David was trying to cover his traces. Look, the great David. And the Bible gives us all the details. You know, if I was a scribe writing the story of David, I would feel uneasy with that. I will move it maybe, make David a great king. But no, the Bible is telling that that's what they say. Mm -hmm. By the contrary, you can say that the Bible is real. It's telling, it's telling a real story. At least a story, you see, you can say somebody lived that. It's so, all the details are there. And you know what David does? When he sees for two nights that he cannot make Uriah do what David wants him to do, he sends him back to the front with a letter of recommendation to his commander. Uriah doesn't know he's carrying his death warrant. And that letter is sealed with a bullet, how we call the bullet. It's the piece of clay that <coughs> prevents any... If the piece of clay is broken, that means some of the radar seals is not supported. So Uriah, as a good man he is, is carrying a letter. Maybe he guesses, but he cannot know what is inside. 
and inside is a horrible thing. It's to his commander to put Uriah at the first line of the next attack so he, and make sure he gets killed. <coughs> mm -hmm. B-U-L-L-A-E. It's, it's an archaeological... Uh, of course, David did not say I have a bullet. It's a seal. Okay? <coughs> Just to make the difference between the parts that you have with you all the time, the seal, the bullet is the print of the seal. So we find always in archaeological excavation a lot of bullets. Not much, not many seals. Okay, so that's just to give you an example. So we find here seals mentioning important people. That's only important people have a seal because they're the ones who are giving orders, moving goods and so on. And what is amazing is that the seal, uh, some of the names are mentioned in the book of uh, Jeremiah. In the Bible, there's a couple of people, I will not tell you the whole name, I, one of them is Gemariahu ben Shafan. He's the mention in the Bible, and he's a minister under the king. Just to tell you that we are in a place that is the center of the center of Jerusalem, that means the center of government. The palace, I don't know, buildings, houses of the important people. So that will be the answer to people who tell you that maybe that the city of David is so small, how can great King David be a king of a place that is maybe uh, uh, 6,000 feet, 600 feet long and uh, 300 feet wide? That's small, guys. People have a house like that. One house. How can you do, how can you explain that? So again, the important people can live here while others will be living around. Like we saw yesterday at uh, Qumran, we saw only public buildings. We don't find houses of people. The people would be living all around, <coughs> not within the walls. Yes. I just wanted to make one brief comment. There's a lesson to be learned in this whole thing with King David. Uh, we know that he did a terrible thing. Had Uriah the Hittite killed on the battlefield, as has already been said. We know that he ends up bringing, after a time of mourning, he brings Bathsheba into his own house and marries her. Now, here's the question. Does God forgive and does God hold a grudge? A grudge. Now, we know that God forgives. What happened? Nathan, the prophet, goes to David, confronts him, said, you stole the lamb of a poor man, talking, of course, about Bathsheba and the lamb. Like, David recognizes it, recognizes his sin, in essence, as forgiveness of his only God. There's only one God that David ever dealt with. And so now, does God hold a grudge? We know he forgives. I don't think that God holds a grudge either once that forgiveness is given because we know that Solomon was the child of Bathsheba. And what did Solomon but become? Not the, first, not the first lady. No, 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 yeah, the but, but was, a, was a child, right? Was a child of David and Bathsheba. And that was the one that became not only a great king, but the one that got to build the temple on the Temple Mount. If God held a grudge, I don't think that he would have been no, allowed to actually do Actually, we see how David repents. <laughs> Right. and cries right. and you can see that in the Psalms right. and that God can identify a real yeah. uh, real uh, repentance. repentance and when you read the Bible guys maybe I'm not saying something new the whole Bible is about that yeah. about you we are sinning all the time but if we repent from the bottom of our heart God forgives so there's no way where God say I will never forgive we can say that to each other but God doesn't say that he can read in the heart because I cannot trust you if you tell me, oh, I harmed you, sorry. Cannot, I don't read in your heart, but God can read in the heart. So when there is a true repentance, he forgives. So the whole message of the Bible, all the New Testament is about that, is about the repentance. And when God forgives, he, he gives us eternal life. So that's a very good example where we are to speak about the story of David and his repentance. And that's why he continues and he's the great king that he is. So he's a man, he makes mistakes, but he repents and God forgives. And that, uh, thanks to him, we have the capital of Israel. He moved from a big city that was called Hebron. Hebron. He was king there seven years and Hebron is a big city, still a big city today. Uh, why Hebron? 
Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are buried there with their wife. Mm -hmm. That's a very important place. <coughs> but the people will not accept the kingdom of David if he's not ruling from a capital that doesn't belong to any of the tribes. All the time you have this, this grudge that there are 12 tribes with a lot of ideas, but the king is from the tribe of Judah. He has at least to show the people that all the tribes are his children. He has no preference on one of them. You can imagine a family when the parents say, that is my preferred son. That's what happened with Joseph, remember that? Yeah. That creates big problems. We should not say that, okay? Uh, I say to my son, I disown you. And then I say immediately the same to the other one. <laughs> I disown you both. I don't want one to think that he's, I love more. And so, you know these ideas. That was just a joke, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you understand the idea here? That David has to choose another place that will be independent. And he comes and the prophet tell him, there's one place that the people will accept. Because that's the place of the covenant, Mount Moriah. And there's a small town there, it's called Jebo. It's so insignificant that it was not captured when, at the time of Joshua, when they captured the land. It was so small, so insignificant, that nobody wanted it. And you know why it's so insignificant? Well, they were Canaanites for one. Ma? Lomamina. Lomamina. Ah, voilà, ma So you understand the, the idea here that it's insignificant because of what? How do you make a big city? Or water? There's one spring here. Calculate how much water used by the inhabitants, you will fall on a number that is about a few thousand. A thousand. Two thousand people at the most. It could not sustain more than that. It will never grow. And look at the terrain. So complicated. And the roads, where are the international highways? They are all bypassing Jivas. They are not important. But then David would choose it for religious reasons and political reasons. It doesn't belong to any of the tribes. Canaanite. It's Canaanite. And it, in its heart is the Mount Moriah. So you have the holy place and you have this, the independent statues. That's why Jesus, uh, sorry, David turned uh, Jebus into Jerusalem and that becomes the capital. Today, there's one million inhabitants in Jerusalem, much more than even Calvin. And there is no, still not enough water. You have already a fifth pipe that has been built to bring water from the coast to Jerusalem. There's no water. The roads are terrible here. Traffic jam are horrible. <laughs> there's nothing economic in, in Jerusalem. If it was not for the choice of David to take Jerusalem, it would have stayed a small, <coughs> provincial small town on the side of the main highway. So that's, we thank David for what he has done here and uh, thanks to him Jerusalem has become so and it will see more and more events in history. So uh, Jeruz in the song Jerusalem it is written Jerusalem mountains around I don't know if you know that. It means that Jerusalem is surrounded by higher mountains. See that? And Jerusalem is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is not the first. It's surrounded by big mountains. But still, it could be defended. At that time, they did not have cannons. So if somebody is on the Mount of Olives, he can see everything happening here, and he cannot shoot at the city. In order to take the city, David will have a very interesting thing to do. What? He will send people to? How, how is the uh, Jebus conquered? Oh, By force? Yeah. Because the source is at the bottom, outside of the city walls. So the, the, the Jebusites knew that they had a problem. They had nice walls and everything, but the water is outside. And in case of siege, how do you get to the water? So they did something, they just dig like a well, like we saw in Megiddo, to get to the spring from within. Okay, that that is a hole. Uh, we call that the pipe. When you read you read the text of the conquest of uh, of Jebus, uh, the man came from the pipe. Joab. Hmm? Yeah. Joab. Joab. And his men they came from the pipe. That means they came from the water system and erupted in the middle of the night in the city. And the city was the, I say city, the village. 
and it was taken very quick. It doesn't look that there's a lot of uh, bloodshed. You know what happens after that? David talks to the king of Jibos and says, Aravna. Remember Aravna? And he says, look, there's a very important place you own, which is your threshing floor. Because Mount Moriah at that time was a threshing floor. Say, I, I want to buy from it, from you. And what is the answer of Aravna? I give it to you. Say, you just conquered my city. <laughs> you want to buy? You own everything. <laughs> you are joking, yes? Say, no. I'm not joking. I want the future generation to know that I own it by law. No, I did not steal it from someone. So give me the price and I will pay. At this moment, the Ravna gets a little bit, ah, you want to buy it? No, I will give it to you. No, no, I want to buy it. He said, you know, it's just 400 or that's a different version, 400 or 600 shekels. I prefer you to take it for free. That's very common in the Middle East. You have to bargain, yes? But when you tell the person, look, the price is so low, so low that I prefer give it to you. It means don't try to bargain here. I will not go lower than that. It's not of your honor to say, to say, oh, give it to me for 500. You cannot do that. He told you, if you don't pay me 600, take it for free. I don't want it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you want small change. And David paid that price. The same happens with Ephron and the cave of the Machpelah with Abraham. The same kind of uh, bargaining. So that's what is happening here. And that's how, um, how uh, uh, David acquired the top of the mountain. He built an altar, but only his son, the man of peace, Shlomo, will build it. Okay, I wanted you this introduction because we are here, that's where it happened. That's an amazing place where you are. It was not the case for many people because for centuries all that was rubble. I told you we have to buy houses, demolish them, and start excavating. Yes. Did King David spare uh, spare his life as a result? Yeah, yeah. Killed? Oh yes. Yeah. It looks like the people had to go. We don't have any mention in the Bible of the massacre of the population of the Jebusites. Je Probably left. We were forced to leave. Probably maybe, but we don't see uh, uh, like other places where you kill all the people there. So. Okay.